Okay. Well, welcome class. Welcome to Hawaii. Uh, we're here in uh, uh, the big island of Hawaii in Kona. And uh, today we're going to be talking about scuba diving. And since I can't be with you back in Salt Lake City, we're going to do our lecture from the boat, uh, uh, di Jack's diving locker boat here in, uh, in Kona. So what we're going to be talking about today is uh, buoyancy. We've talked about buoyancy bef uh, in class before and with respect to balloons floating in air. Today we're going to be talking about buoyancy floating in water, how scuba divers can control their buoyancy using Archimedes' principle. We're going to be talking about the, um, the uh, ideal gas law, so how pressure and volume in a gas are inversely related. So if you increase the pressure, you decrease the volume. If you decrease the volume, you increase the pressure. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, how you propel yourself through water, uh, how you can transfer momentum to the water, and the water will then transfer momentum to you, and how whether, you're use, whether you transfer uh, uh, momentum to a large mass of water or a small mass of water uh, affects how much energy you have to use. Okay? We're going to uh, show you how masses of air, when they become uh, under, under pressure, will, will shrink so that their volumes will decrease. We're also going to talk about how light and sound, some phenomena related to light and sound in water, how light when it enters water can actually bend, that's called refraction, how the uh, absorption of light and the transmission of light through a dense medium like water, how that depends on the color, on the wavelength. So what we'll find is that as we go deeper, the different colors, you lose different colors faster so that as you go deeper, things which are very colorful on the surface become kind of dull. Uh, deeper down and you need a light to bring back the color. You need a local light that's, that's down there with you rather than relying on the sunlight filtering through a deep layer of, of water. We'll talk about how sound, sound actually travels, travels uh, quicker in water and that actually leads to interesting phenomena with respect to how you hear things because in air when we hear a sound coming from a, a particular direction, we know that it's coming from a particular direction because one of our ears will hear it slightly before the other and your brain processes that delay and so you turn towards the sound. In water, since it travels faster, that delay is smaller and you have a hard time figuring out where sound is coming from. slide up here we can do this and the other arch is going to be almost on the, underneath the bow of their boat the pointy end of their boat five minutes now you guys are all certified divers most of least people my job and bob's job is going to be to get you back to the boat at about 500 pounds so you can do your safety stuff so try to avoid touching any coral uh it, it saves that your hands getting cut it also saves the coral you know touch live coral and what happens comes dead coral so please try to try to control your buoyancy really well down there we have a uh, no harass, no kill type policy at Jack's, which means we don't break up uh, sea urchins to draw in other fish. We don't throw food in the water to draw in fish and things like that. Try to try to enjoy the, the, the fish marine life in their natural habitat. So. 3,000 PSI. This is the first stage of the regulator. This reduces the pressure from about 3,000 PSI. So you can see this hose that goes to this console. This, this, uh, um, pressure meter is going to this first stage regulator and then this hose here comes to the second stage that you put in your mouth which reduces the pressure to whatever the pressure you are whatever depth you are
so when we were uh, underwater we blew up a balloon down at about 60, 60 or so 65 feet which is about three atmospheres of pressure one atmosphere for the for the air and then two atmospheres of water we blew it up when we first blew it up it was maybe about that big now you can see that it's expanded we also blew up we also put some air in a little plastic bottle some water and now this thing is really hard I can't hardly you can see how my fingers are barely indenting it when I'm pressing hard it's over full because the air expanded as I came up to pre as I came up to lower pressure the air tries to expand but the uh, the plastic bottle keeps it from doing so. You take the top off without pointing the lid at your face. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's the uh, take this top off. You can see the in here that the, it's fresh. That's right. You can hear see and hear the pressure releasing. There, you saw when I was underwater how much that crushed when we when we blew it up on the on the surface. The, uh, the foam didn't really work, the foam, foam cup didn't really work. You can see it's kind of deformed, but uh, we didn't go deep enough to keep that, to make that small. And then the tennis ball is back to uh, normal shape. Underwater there, you saw that it was uh, sort of crushed into a little concave shape. I want to snorkel with that shark. Go right ahead. Jeff, you want to get in with the camera? Yeah. I'll go with you. Miles will get, I'll try get to, in. I'll, I'll go with you. You going to get in? I'll get in. I know that you did that. Thank you. Uh, Where's the shark? Fantastic. It's great. That was my question. Where's the shark? Uh, it's somewhere right behind the boat. So cute. So tiny. Put it in the rinse bucket. Okay, so in diving a lot, what you have is an interface between um, a liquid, like water usually, and, and air or, a, or a, a gas. And whenever you pressurize that system, if you put more pressure in the gas, if you squeeze it, then more of the gas will be dissolved in the, in the liquid. So this is really important in diving, particularly when we're talking about the absorption of nitrogen. So when we breathe in, right, we breathe in air that has some nitrogen in it. In fact, it's, uh, it's mostly nitrogen. And when, we, when we're sitting up here on the, on the surface, our tissues and our blood doesn't dissolve much nitrogen because uh, it's not under very much pressure. But then when we go down underwater and as we descend in the, in the water column and the pressure gets larger and larger, one, another atmosphere of pressure for every 10 meters or 33 feet, then you get an increased rate of absorption of nitrogen. And what that does is, is that your blood now carries extra nitrogen. And if you ascend, uh, then that nitrogen can either just get re, basically go back into your lungs and you breathe it out, which is what you want. But if you come up too fast, then that nitrogen can form bubbles. And when those bubbles form, they, that's a problem because they, they'll form in your tissue or they'll form in your blood. And those and that uh, those bubbles can then circulate through your blood. They can cause a stroke. They can get in your in your brain. They can get into your heart, 
or they can just sort of get lodged in uh, different places where you have nerves and press on the nerves and cause a lot of pain. And so this is called the bends or um, decompression sickness. And the other thing that can happen is when you get too deep and you have too much nitrogen in your blood and you start to feel a little drunk, that's called nitrogen narcosis. And so you're, uh, you just start to feel a little goofy. That, that one is really easy to cure. You just come up a little bit and basically that, uh, you, basically that feeling goes away as the nitrogen goes back into the, to the gas and you breathe it out. And so this Henry's Law is, uh, is basically relating to pressure in the gas and how much of that gas gets dissolved into a liquid when you have an interface like that. And it's really important in scuba diving. We'll demonstrate it later with uh, when we come back up. It's hard to demonstrate it when we're sitting uh, underwater. Um, the only thing that we can do is that you can you have a dive computer or you have dive tables where they've calculated how fat if you if you stay down for a particular length of time how uh, how long you can stay down at a particular depth before you have to come up uh, so that you don't get too much nitrogen in your blood and these tables have been compiled over many many years and then these these dive computers have algorithms that are based on on the on Henry's law. And the dive computers are nice because they continuously update how much nitrogen you're absorbing. And so you can actually use them to stay down longer. Um, and since we went diving already today, we still have some residual nitrogen in our blood. So if we went and did the same dive we did this morning, we wouldn't be able to spend as much time down there because we still have residual nitrogen in our blood that takes quite a while to, to go back into the gas. Um, while we, uh, when we're sitting up here at, uh, at atmospheric pressure. And so we would actually, we actually aren't, typically second dives during the day are not as long as the first, or, or you can't go as deep, simply so that you don't, uh, so you don't get this excess, excess nitrogen in your blood. So Jordan, uh, when we're down there, I'm gonna blow a couple air rings. Uh, it's something I've learned how to do. I don't really understand how they work or why they work, but I'll blow a puff of air out of my mouth and it'll make a circular bubble. Can you explain it? Well, sure. Um, what happens is that the when you blow air out of your mouth, there's there's a uh, friction, a, a drag between the air. I mean, when the air is going out of your lips, and that air that's near your lips slows down. The air that's closer to the center, away from your lips, is actually still goes at the uh, same speed. So that creates this sort of different velocities, which then curls the the, the air into sort of a, a sort of a vortex pattern. And you can imagine that this happens all the way around your circuit when you make you form your lips into a sort of a circle. And so the, the, the air that's going close to your lips will go slower. The air that's going in the middle will go faster. And that creates a little sort of a vortex pattern. And then when it, when it, when it blows out, it just keeps getting bigger. And then as it, if it, as it goes up towards the surface, it'll just keep expanding. Why does it get bigger? Well, as the pressure is being reduced as you go towards the surface, so when we're at the surface of the, of the water, we're at one atmosphere of pressure. Every 33 feet below the surface, we get another atmosphere of pressure since water is so dense. And so as you, if you blow a bubble, if you blow a bubble at the bottom, the pressure is high. And then as the, as the air, ri as the uh, bubble rises and it goes into regions of lower pressure, then it will expand uh, so that it will basically equalize the pressure with the bubbles, the, the air on the inside will have the same pressure as the air on the, out, as the uh, water on the outside. And to do that, it has to expand, give this air more room, uh, more volume, and so the pressure goes down. Makes sense, because it starts out the size of my lips. It starts out the size of your lips. When it gets to the surface, sometimes it's as big as the boat. That's right. Can we can we look, can we look at those when we're under there? Absolutely. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll blow the, the bubble and we'll get Miles here to film it. Yeah. Yep. Here we go, physicist. <laughs> It's a Cartesian diver, man. Floats up here, it'll sink down there.
So what we're looking at now is called the cleaning station. These um, purple and yellow fish are called the Hawaiian cleaner wrasse, okay? And the fish that they're sort of nibbling at is called the Anaso tang, okay? And what's happening there is that the, the, these, these wrasses set up um, a little cleaning station that, that the other fish know about, the bigger fish know about, and they come in and signal that they want to get cleaned by exposing a gill or opening their mouth or sometimes even going completely vertical. And that signals to the, to the wrasse that they should come in and clean off all the little parasites that are in their gills and on their skin and in their mouth. And so the wrasse get to keep what they eat. The tang don't eat the wrasse because they're doing them a favor and it's a nice symbiotic relationship. Um, the wrasse, basically, the, the bigger fish know that this is a cleaning station because the wrasse kind of do a little dance to sort of signal that that's what's going on. And so often you'll see actually fish kind of lined up to go in and get cleaned. Okay, so the golden rule of diving is never hold your breath. When we saw that balloon coming up and we put air in it down at depth at higher pressure, because pressure and volume are inversely related in the gas by Boyle's Law, when that balloon came up and it expands, if you kept air in your lungs, if you breathed in air at depth under high pressure and then you filled up your lungs and then when you came up when you come up if you hold your breath your that that air will expand and expand and expand and eventually your lungs will either explode or you'll by Henry's law you'll press you'll push a bunch of air into your into your blood or your tissues which can form a bubble and then cause a stroke or whatever bad stuff so the golden rule of diving is never hold your breath and um, just keep basically just breathing normally. All right, so when we were underwater, you saw that we can use a lift bag like this to lift up heavy objects that are underwater. And let's, let's go through that in a little more detail and see how that works. First of all, this is open on the bottom, okay? And you, we can use a regulator that we take out of our mouth to actually put air inside, as you saw us doing, okay? And so the, the question is, how, do you, how much air do we actually need to put in here to, to lift a particular, uh, an object with a particular weight, okay? And so the way that we, um, th there's a couple things we need to know, we need to understand to be able to calculate that. The first is that the water density, the density of water is in, in American units, uh, 64 pounds per cubic feet. So each cubic foot of water is about 64 pounds. So here I have a milk crate. Okay, this is a roughly a foot on a side. So this is about a cubic foot. And if I filled this full of water, if I made this solid and filled it full of water, the water would weigh 64 pounds. Okay, and this is actually where um, where we get atmospheric pressure. So if you imagine actually 
dividing this into 144, so 12 inches by 12 inches, 144 one-inch squares, okay? then the amount of pressure from the atmosphere pressing down on each one of those squares is 14.7 pounds. Okay? On each one of those squares, you have 14.7 pounds just from the atmosphere. If we um, then fill that full of water, okay, and we ask how much water, the weight of the water um, in each one of those squares, just one foot of water, okay, so if we, if we look at one foot depth of water pressing on one inch squared, then what we get is that would weigh uh, roughly half a pound, 0.445 pounds. So each 33 feet of water okay, um, in one inch squared weighs, on a one inch square surface, weighs 14.7 pounds. Okay? So if we have a, uh, an object which weighs 64 pounds, okay, by Archimedes principle, if we want to lift that using the lift bag, we need to displace an amount of water equal to one cubic foot, a volume of one cubic feet, one cubic foot, because one cubic foot weighs 64 pounds. One cubic foot of water weighs 64 pounds. So what we need to do is put one cubic foot of air in the lift bag, roughly, if you neglect the, the, the weight of the lift bag, one cubic foot of air in the lift bag, if we're lifting a 64 pound um, object, and that will then become neutrally buoyant, and it will start to float, and as you saw, once it starts to float, if it gets up just a little higher, that air will expand because we're putting it in at pressure. We're putting the air in at pressure, at depth, and it will actually accelerate. So, when if we have this weight belt sitting at 33 feet of water, okay, that's an extra atmosphere of pressure in addition to atmospheric. So we have two atmospheres of pressure. So the air, the way that the regulator works, is that when the air, when you any air that comes out of it is going to be emitted at the same pressure as the atmospheric pressure. And since the pressure is deeper there, we know um, by the ideal gas law and by um, even Boyle's law that the, that the density is going to be, the density of that air is also going to be, um, is going to be larger. Okay? So when I put air into the lift bag, it's going to be twice as dense. And so in order to fill up a cubic foot of volume, I actually need to take two cubic feet of air out of my tank because that tank was filled at atmospheric pressure. Okay? And since our tank holds, a typical tank holds 80 cubic feet, okay? then if we need to take out two cubic feet for our lift bag, we'll be taking out 1 40th of our tank. And so we can look at this on our pressure regulator. We can actually see the pressure go down as we fill it up. But since 1 40th of the tank is not a big number, not a big fraction of the tank, we can actually just use the tank on our back. We don't have to take it down a separate tank to, to lift something as, as small as a 64 pound weight. If we were lifting something really large, okay, 500 pound something or 1,000 pound something, and you, have, you can get lift bags that are that big, uh, like an anchor or something, then you would need to use, probably you need to bring down um, an extra tank to fill up that lift bag, depending on the depth. So if we went down now to three atmospheres of pressure, okay, so if we went down to not 33 feet, but 66 feet, okay, then we would need three cubic feet of, of air instead of one cubic foot of air to lift that, to lift that uh, weight belt. Well, light from the sun is composed of all the different colors. That's why it looks fairly white, okay? And so we have some blue light, okay? And we have some red light, okay? Now, it turns out that the blue light actually in seawater tends to penetrate to, to, long, to greater depths. The red light actually basically gets stopped at a shallower depth. And so what happens is that this blue light gets reflected off objects where the, when you're, when you're de at depth and you see things as blue, but the red light doesn't, isn't there, so it can't be reflected. And so you get more blue light than red light being reflected off objects, and so things tend to look blue or greenish underwater. Well, first of all, you can shake, take a, a, a light, like a flashlight, an underwater flashlight, and shine it on your object. Okay? And then what you get is you can restore that color because you've, you've, you've put the light close enough that it's not being absorbed, the red's not being absorbed uh, enough. The other thing you can do is on a camera, you can have a filter uh, um, which 
filters out some of the blue light. Okay, so basically it restores some of the color balance. So things tend to look blue. You actually filter some of that blue out, but you let all the red pass through. And so things tend to come back to their natural color. And when we were swimming around underneath, you saw that Jeff was actually sometimes putting in and out the filter, shining the light on things, and you can see the color come back um, when you put the blue filter in or when you shine a light on something that's very colorful. All right, so the way that you swim, the way that anything really swims in water, the way that you propel yourself, is that you can't just push against a wall or uh, like you would, you know, um, you know, on roller skates or something. You have to, you push against the water and the water moves away. So you, you push on, it's basically momentum conservation. You use your feet and typically, typically when you're scuba diving, just your feet and your flippers to push on the water and give it, impart some momentum to the water and the water then will impart some momentum to you. Okay, so it's a Newton's third law pair. You apply force um, over some time, so you give an impulse to the water, and the water gives an impulse right back to you. Okay, so if we have the mass of the swimmer, so the, this is the this is the momentum of the swimmer, the swimmer's mass times the swimmer's velocity is equal to the water's mass times the water's velocity. That's the amount of water that you get moving times the, the velocity of that water that you get moving. Okay, so this is momentum conservation, and so you can give yourself more velocity, more thrust, either by moving a particular mass of water faster by increasing V, or by moving a, a larger mass of water but move it, move it less fast. Okay? Either way, you can trade these things off and you can get the same thrust. Okay? So you can get the same momentum by either increasing the mass of the water or increasing the velocity of the water. Okay? But as it turns out, there's not those two things aren't really equal because you also have to expend energy you have to do work to actually get thrust and when you push against water right it's, when you push against a wall you do no work on the wall because it doesn't move okay remember work requires a force applied and a distance moved it doesn't move so you don't do any work on the wall but when you push on water you actually do work on it because you move it okay and so we can calculate how much work we do on the water, essentially, by basically just calculating its kinetic energy. This is the kinetic energy right here, as we've discussed in class, okay, of the water. And so the work that we do on the water, the work that the swimmer has to do to accelerate the water to, to obtain thrust is equal to the mass of the water, this should be W here, times the velocity of the water squared times a half. Okay, so if we have, um, if we impart the thing to notice here is that the kinetic energy goes as the velocity of the water squared. Okay? So if we have to move some water very fast, okay, then we have to do a lot of work. So that tells you that in fact if you want to get a large thrust, get a, lar a large momentum transfer from the water by pushing on it, but do a minimal amount of work, you actually don't want to push the water very fast. So to get good thrust, very efficient um, propulsion through the water, you want to actually move a large mass of water but not move it very fast. Okay, so you want to make M big, V small, so that the work you have to do is not very big. Okay? And so that's why when we, when we use, when we, when we scuba dive, right, we typically don't use our feet or small flippers. Okay? We want to use bigger flippers. These are sort of extremely big flippers that are used for, for uh, uh, deep water um, free divers that want to get hundreds and hundreds of feet down. And so this is a very efficient way to propel yourself is by moving a large mass of water. This is a much larger surface area than your foot. And so large mass of water gets pushed. You part a large mass of water, not so much, not, not so high velocity, and that's very efficient. Um, boats use this concept for propulsion. The propellers tend to be rather large. And, the, and for big cruising type ships, like a cruise ship, you'll find that the propellers there are huge, really massive, and you have to have really big engines to, to supply enough torque to get, that, to get that propeller moving, but you then are going to be moving a large propeller, a large uh, mass of water, but you don't actually have to move it that fast to get a, uh, a good momentum kick, a good, uh, to get good thrust and good propulsion. So if, you're, if you happen to come across a shark, um, or you want to be swimming fast, then um, if, you use, or if you're just using your feet, 
then you are not going to be able to very efficiently propel yourself through the water. And you're not going to be able to get going as fast and you're going to get tired very quickly. If you use, if you basically make your feet larger so that you can move a larger mass of water by putting on flippers, then you can actually uh, propel yourself much more efficiently and you can uh, go much further, much longer distances without, uh, without using as much energy, without doing as much work, and it's much more efficient propulsion so that you can, uh, you can eventually get away from the shark. So as you can see, if you are not using fins, uh, so that you're, so the amount of volume, uh, the, the amount of mass of water that you're moving is small, your propulsion is not efficient, and you're not going to be able to get away from the shark, and the shark's going to get you. Okay, so you're looking at the edge of a koozie here that you would use to keep your beer or soda or sometimes in Utah maybe your milk cold. And um, what you see there is that on a cross section, you can see lots of little bubbles, okay? And that kind of material is actually very similar to, what, to a wetsuit material, okay? So wetsuit material, here's a wetsuit, and the, the, the seams are sewn, so you can't see it, but if I were able to look at that on edge, you would see something very similar to that koozie. Okay, so you may have noticed when we were on all the underwater shots that many of us, if not all of us, were wearing a wetsuit. And that's a bit curious because in Hawaii, the air temperature is about 80 degrees and the water temperature is about 80 degrees too. So why is it that we feel very comfortable? We can live essentially forever um, in 80 degree air, but 80 degree water, we get cold actually quite fast. So the reason is that um, air is a, pretty, is a poor conductor of heat, okay? So we don't transfer, we're not able to transfer heat to 80 degree air very well, okay? But water is a very good conductor of heat. In fact, we call some, we'll talk about later in the class, the heat capacity of water is very high. The amount of energy which it takes to raise the temperature of water, it takes a lot, a lot of energy. Okay? And so when, when, when we get in the water at 98 degrees, our bodies are 98 degrees, and the, temp, the water temperature is 80, basically we're trying to heat up the water, but it's, it's not going to do that. It's going to stay at the same temperature. It takes an enormous amount of energy. So what we do is that we use a wetsuit okay, to provide a little layer of insulation. That air, it, basically those little bubbles, those little uh, air pockets which you saw in the koozie are filled with air and those basically insulate us from the, from the water so that it can maintain a temperature difference between one side of the, of the wetsuit, the outside and the inside. If you remember Henry's Law, is that if you have a liquid and an air interface and you pressurize the air, or pressurize the gas, that you'll get more gas going into solution than you would uh, under normal circumstances. Okay, so the best way to, to, uh, to simulate that, since we can't actually look into um, uh, the body of a diver uh, as they absorb nitrogen and then as that nitrogen comes out and bubbles out as they, as they ascend in the water column, is to actually look at a, at a carbonated drink. Okay? So this bottle of Pacifico beer was, was bottled with an excess pressure of carbon dioxide in the neck. Okay? And so there's actually a higher pressure than atmospheric in the neck. And so there's actually extra carbon dioxide that's dissolved in this, in this beer. So if we, if we open it up, okay, then what, we, what you'll see is that you can see the bubbles come out of solution and start to bubble up to the top. Okay? And that was again beca caused because we also all of a sudden we re reduced the pressure and now that um, all that carbon dioxide wants to come out of solution. Now we wouldn't want that to happen to us um, underwater with, with nitrogen because it would bubble into our, into our um, tissues and it would bubble into our, our blood and cause pain and maybe even death, a stroke. And so, um, and so that's why you have to actually come up very slowly so that some of that uh, nitrogen gets reabsorbed and into the lungs and then you just basically breathe it out. Now, the best way to deal with such a beverage, first of all, we don't want it to become to, thermal, uh, to thermally equilibrate to room temperature, so we're going to put it in our little koozie to insulate it. And then what we want, we don't want this to come to room temperature, so we actually have to drink it. 
And so, Jeff, thanks a lot for your help. You're welcome. I'm going to simulate a diver returning to the surface as well with my beverage. And uh, nicely done. Thank thanks you very, very much. much. Thanks, Jeff, very much. Aloha. Aloha. Okay. So we've discussed some of the more dangerous aspects of scuba diving um, in this video. But I want to emphasize that scuba diving is actually a quite safe sport nowadays. Um, and it's been made that way through a solid understanding of the laws of physics. And in fact, the pioneers of scuba diving um, several decades ago really helped to make scuba diving safe by really understanding the laws of physics. Boyle's law, Henry's law, the ideal gas law, um, all these issues that we've talked about were discovered and put into practice by these pioneers of scuba diving to make, to make uh, scuba diving quite safe. All the equipment which we use, the buoyancy control device, which we use to control our buoyancy, the air pressure regulator, which we use to breathe safely at depth, um, even our, you know, the ability to move around efficiently underwater by using flippers instead of our feet. All these things are based on solid physics principles um, and make scuba diving quite enjoyable and quite safe. If you actually decide to get certified in scuba diving, and as you progress up the scuba diving training ladder, then you'll actually be required to know um, some of these laws of physics and to be able to apply them to the relevant aspects of scuba diving. So uh, you'll actually have a little leg up on the other students in that regard, because now you know a little bit more than the average person. Um, so we encourage you, really, to get involved in scuba diving. If this is uh, something that interests you, please go out and get certified by Patty or some other um, Patty or some other uh, certification agency, and and go and, and dive and have fun. It's a great sport, and uh, if you've got kids, you can even get them certified uh, starting quite young. So please please go out and have fun in the water.